Um, so this presentation is mainly about this paper that we did at FC Financial Cryptography last year, which was a, an SOK. SOKs are civilization of knowledge, which means we went through all the scattered knowledge of human uh, information and like gathered everything in one place and started like coming up with frameworks of how to think about these scenarios. Like uh, we were talking about front running attacks before a lot. But you never had specific ways of talking about them and like putting, um, like more explaining them without like having to have a whole paragraph of explaining the, the attacks. So before starting, I'm going to like go through three stories, um, and we'll see how, what they have in common. So one of the first stories about an ICO, um, and you all probably know that in mid 2017, there was this whole peak of the ICO hype. And um, basically, users could buy uh, the tokens at the ICO price and a few days later sell it uh, in the market. So usually the workflow was, there was this website, they had a white paper, they had a promise that it's going to go to the moon. And mainly because this hype was because of the ERC-20 standard, as you may know, that it made it so easy to start a new token. Like before that, people had to like come up with the network, start mining, like have their own coin. And with the ERC-20, it was like so easy to just make the coin, token. And it would have been tradable right after, like usually with a few days of when the token sale contract would allow transfers. And one of the things that they did is, so it was limited time, except some others like EOS that was like almost a year. Uh, usually it was like a month or so. Uh, after the DAO, uh, they realized that uh, we need a hard cap or some kind of cap on these uh, ICOs because we must get more money than we want. So they started having these hard or soft caps, which meant if it reach, reaches that amount, like it would stop selling. So it more helps with the hype and how um, this whole hype uh, of the ICO hype happened. So the flow was that uh, one user c would come, send one ether to this contract, say, get a thousand tokens, then the markets would just exist, like ether, delta, or some other that even don't need any permission of listing. So it would just send a thousand tokens there and usually sell it with a good profit. Now this is a bit exaggerated, but like usually the profits were like pretty good. Um, so now the problem was that someone or as I say, whales could come and buy like all the tokens up front, like pay a lot of gas, get in front of everyone else, um, and buy all the tokens, go to the market, just sell them for a way a lot more um, ether. And this is mainly for the supply and demand. So if someone can buy all the tokens and reach the cap, then everyone else would want that token because they know the demand is high and they would pay more premium on the other markets. So this was one of the problems. So status ICO in, um, I think, May 2017, they started doing an ICO and they wanted to make the ICOs fair again. So how would that work? So one of the things that they did was um, under a smart contract, they limit gas price. So um, any if any transaction would come to that contract with more than 50 gigaway, it would just reject the transaction. And it was not well communicated, I would say, to the users. So a lot of users use the same method, um, or maybe it was bots, were bots, and that they send a lot of transactions with high gas price and clog the network. Like if you go back to uh, that time, like mid 2017, there's like these spikes of like gas price, which were mostly with these kind of um, ICOs. And here, People were sending high gas price and miners were like choosing those and the actual transaction was not, we're not going to. The other thing that they did, which was really interesting, uh, we'll see how that turned out, was this dynamic cap or ceiling, which um, they would basically have a ceiling depending on the amount, deposit, maximum deposit amount per ceiling. Like at first you couldn't buy more than 10 ether, like let's say. Uh, and after that, it would be more like a bit more. Um, so it would just return the money back to the user. So what happened was uh, that um, 
let's say here, if user sends a thousand ether on the first ceiling to the contract, the contract would generate some amount of token, but return most of the ETH back to the user. So this way, they wouldn't, they would prevent whales from buying all the tokens. And because of the gas price, they wouldn't be able to probably um, get in front of everyone else. So what happened? Yeah, it was June 2017. So they raised around 300,000 ETH um, in 16 hours, even though they wanted to go for a month. And they got almost 100, more than 100,000 attempts, refunded 100, 100,000 attempts, and a total of 347,000 ETH. So they refunded more than they actually got, like, raised. That's the interesting thing. Um, I mean, it's not greedy, right? Um, so there was something interesting here that I saw on Reddit and other things that people said looking into that, that there was something weird about this ICO. So I started getting all the data, so all the transactions that went to this smart contract on that time, I gathered them and I defined two things. One was successful transactions, which was the transactions that resulted in token purchase. It could result in refunds. That's okay, as long as you purchase some tokens. The other one is um, the failed transaction. So if the, trans the transaction failed to purchase any token, either because it had high gas price or it was after it was like after they they reached the cap or any other reason. So we tried to map these on uh, some charts because charts are cool, and we saw that like the miners in the network at that time based on the blocks they mine. So this could these numbers could be actually a bit different from the reality of the hash power, but usually statistically they're right. So Ether mine, F2Pool, they both had almost one fourth of the network and the rest. So this was the chart that we were expecting because um, as I said, these transactions differ so these are all the transactions that went to this status ICO. But they don't, they are not different for the miners. They are all valid transactions, paying gas, going to a smart contract. So as you can see, this is almost a homogeneous distribution between success and fail, because for um, the miner, which is working on another incentive layer, should not matter if these transactions are successful or fail, failing. Uh, but what we saw was this. Like This was what I actually saw in the data. So there is something interestingly weird here. So why if to pull successful transactions are way lower than their failed transactions and why it differs from other mining mining pools. So what are these transactions that are missing here? We started looking into that and uh, we realized that the transactions that are included in F2 pool blocks are F2, mostly F2 pools own, their own transactions. Um, so this is a chart um, that so I'll explain this in a second. So like, um, as you can see on top left, the F2 pool address, this is the address that F2 pool uses for the mining rewards. So we see on even Ether scan, it's labeled as F2 pool. So a few days before a status ICO, there was around like 30 addresses, like newly generated addresses that received 100 ETH from this address, from F2 pool address. And um, when the ICO happened, all those addresses sent um, almost 100 Ether to status ICO. And as you can see, the number two is basically all those 30 transactions that went to the status ICO. Some portion went to um, status multi-signature wallets. A bunch, around 63 Ether got refunded and they generated some tokens. So these were all successful transactions in purchasing tokens. Um, so most of these transactions that were included in F2 pool were these transactions. So they um, only mined their own transaction. And one thing, so even till here, I wasn't sure if these addresses belong to F2 pool. I was like, maybe someone withdrew from F2 pool and bought this. But then a few days after, they returned that 63.1 ether, the step three, back to F2 pool reward address. So just making sure that you know that this was f 2 pools addresses. So basically these missing transactions are censored successful transactions. So f 2 pool here censored some transaction in order to get status tokens. So this was one story. 
The other one is about FOMO 3D. Um, I wish I could see your, the screen of the other participants. I really want to know how many people know about the FOMO 3D, how many people have participated in this, but um, that's okay. So FOMO 3D, for those that may not know, was uh, really similar to one experiment in Reddit called the button, which uh, there's a countdown timer and um, a person, like, so anyone can buy tickets. And if you buy a ticket, the timer is increased by 30 seconds. But the goal of this is to be the last ticket holder when the timer reaches zero and you win all the money in the pot. So in this screenshot in the back, um, you see this 350 ether, but the numbers are like very higher when this was on the peak. So um, yeah, at the peak, it, it was holding around 29,000 ether, which is $13 million. Uh, but it was also paying, like there's so many incentive models there um, that was paying like dividends to the early key holders and some other participants. So this was considered to be a never ending game, uh, but we'll see what happened. So this is, imagine this is the Ethereum network, that's FOMO 3D smart contract. So in the third week of August, we have this character called Walter. I don't think till today we actually know who that person was. Maybe it's participating in this conference. So anyways, um, so Walter deployed a bunch of contracts to the network they were a bit sophisticated in the sense that how they use the gas. So, so they did some checks, um, like asserts, and see if, if they should use all the gas sent to them or not, uh, which I'll say in a bit, like what those checks were. So what happened was when the timer in the FOMO 3D uh, was around like three minutes, Walter bought a ticket using buy uh, XID uh, function. So he bought a ticket in FOMO 3D. And we assume that when this happened, when the timer is going down, other people wanted to buy tickets, right? That's um, how the system works. So people are trying to buy tickets, but then Walter sent really high gas price transaction around 500 gigawatt, which is more than 10 times of the high gas price that we usually use to these contracts. And what those uh, contracts do is they do some checks. They check if FOMO 3D is still active, if Walter is the last ticket or not, and if all those, they assert and they use all the gas sent to them. So what happens is, so then we know that um, miners are only incentivized by the economy of their task. So if a transaction pays more gas, they would choose that compared to like other transactions. There are some other factors there they could have whitelisted and all, but overall they use this method. Even Geth uses the same method to like sort transactions. So this is like the first block after this happens, as you can see. Um, this like, this gas price is like 190, but the Sigur Walter paid 1.5 ether to fill up the the block and don't let any other transaction go in. So like these this went on for a while and as you can see like here so this list is all the transactions in that block it is 905 block so there are some transaction with lower gas fee which would probably be transfers of the the mining pools address to some other addresses but then there is this 501 ones and it's sorted based on how much gas they're paying so this now Walter paid around around 4 ether to just make sure no transaction is going through. And this went on for a while, as you can see, timer is uh, going down. And the last block, it, this was a fascinating uh, block because uh, we saw, it, it's interesting that someone, you see the first transaction zero, someone noticed that this is happening and they paid 5,000 ego away to make sure they can get the last ticket. But, the timer was already zero, so basically they paid 1.69 ether to finish the game and change the state to Walter being the winner. And as you can see, after that, all Walter transactions still have 501 gigaway gas price, but they're not using all the gas because those sophisticated checks, they check if FOMO 3D is done or not. And because it's already done and Walter is the winner, they just 
would not use all the gas sent to them. So um, a few days after Walter, a few hours after Walter sent a transaction to withdraw and got 10,469 ether back as his reward. And it was almost $3 million at that time, um, which was a good game, right? So the third story is about DEX um, and decentral exchanges. And so decentral exchanges, as we know, most of them, like except um, some like Uniswap, like also con consider that these pa this paper and this research was done um, a year and a half ago. So like Uniswap wasn't really a big thing then. Uh, so these order books really usually have like on-chain smart contract and off-chain order books. Uh, and the reason for that, so like this would be the system. Because I assume the cloud is Ethereum blockchain, the square is DEX on-chain smart contract, and we have the off-chain server or which holds order books. And this green line, green circle is basically the decentral exchange with all its modules. And the reason for this is, uh, so we want orders for people to be able to like bid and ask and put orders in the order book really fast almost free or low fees possibly. And um, at the same time, we want to use the smart contract and the abilities to match and um, have the security of the blockchain. But in that case, filling the orders and cancellation requires on-chain transactions. They're costly, you have to pay the fees and the gas and they're slower, right? So this is like overall the DEX and how it would work. Um, all right, so here, let's say Adam wants to use this text, how the workflow would work uh, in that story. So he would just send an HTTP request or HTTPS request, like a normal, not a transaction, to the off-chain order book saying, I want to buy a thousand useless Ethereum tokens. Um, so he sends that, the order is on the order book. Now the market suddenly moves and this order is not profitable anymore. So what he does is he's sending a transaction with cancel order ID. This is a transaction to the smart contract saying, I want to cancel this order. And he's expecting to see something like this, that a miner would mine the cancel order and the order would be just gone from the order book, right? But do you, um, remember Walter. <laughs> Walter is like always watching the mempool there and he sees this transaction. So um, let's go through this. Why would someone cancel an order? Probably it's not profitable for them anymore, right? So if it's not profitable for them, if you fill that order, it would be profitable for you. That's most probably. Uh, so Walter can check the order if it's more profitable for him. He can send a transaction fill order ID with a high gas price and try to get in front of the cancel ID. And like this is probably what would happen. So um, the miner sees the high gas price transaction, the miner chooses that, and Walter ends up with all the money and Adam would end up with a thousand useless Ethereum tokens. Um, so also consider that in this case, Walter could be the miner too. So miners could be malicious in this sense and choose the fill order ID, they put the fill order ID before the cancel order. And in this case, because cancel would fail, it would uh, use, all, use up all the gas. So even Walter would make more money. So miners can also use these methods to uh, get more money out of this um, the system. So, oh, there's something wrong with this slides. Anyways. So what do these stories have in common? Um, like what is the puzzle here that we're trying to solve? So um, all of these attacks were called front-running attacks within the community. Like everything you say, like front-running attacks on the ICO and all. But were they the same? Like they weren't really the same. Um, they had some differences in there. So let's go back, take one step back and define what we're talking about here. Uh, so front running comes from like this um, stock market and financial instrument markets. 
And mainly it, it is the course of action where someone benefits from early access to market information about upcoming transaction trades, meaning that they are in a privileged position along the transmission of information. Um, I really suggest if you're interested, read this paper, Front Running Insider Trading Under the Commodity Exchange Act by Markham. Uh, this paper was in 1988 and was one of the first places that um, discussed front running as a bad um, or unethical activity. Because even till then, people thought this is a really okay thing to do. And even till 2012, like the history of this is, uh, they started to consider front running a bad thing. Um, so people already frame was like making a lot of money and people were like, oh wow, this is like really profitable. This is a good thing. And more people started doing that. And after the Black Monday on 1987, they started to say, oh, this is not a good thing. So it started like putting laws against doing front running. And it took till 2012 till uh, front running was considered bad in all other financial instrument markets. But this is a really interesting paper. It's pretty long, but it's interesting. So now coming to the blockchain. Um, Basically, everyone that are running full nodes in the network have access to this privileged information because they see the transactions that are coming without, before, before they get confirmed. Um, and miners are in more privileged position because they can change the order uh, of the transaction in the block they mine. And also, miners, as we saw, can be bribed in the sense of like the, uh, getting paying more fees, right? So if you pay more transaction fees, more gas price, you probably can get in faster. So we end up coming up with this table of how we can, we can talk about front running attacks in a more systematic way. So um, I'll go through like some of the examples at the end, but just to go through this table, uh, displacement attacks would be like the, all the front running attacks are in three different categories, displacement, insertion, and suppression. Displacement means that like you front run a transaction and you don't uh, care if the second, if the original transaction gets mined or not, or what happens to that. So let's say if you want to front run a domain name registration. So if you front run that and you register that, you don't even care if the original transaction gets in or not. Insertion is more, um, it, you are you care about that original transaction. You want that to be executed after your transaction. Uh, one of the examples is to basically say sandwich orders, like means that there is an order coming to a DEX that says like buy this um, asset at the market price, and you can see that in the order book there is a better price to sell. Uh, so if you can buy, it's basically like the same as like hard frequency trading. So you buy at the best price, you sell it at the market price to the user, and you basically get the difference, right? Um, and the last one is suppression, or also there was some blog post talking about this as like block stuffing attack. So it's what we saw in Formal 3D that, or even mainly Formal 3D, that you run a function or send a transaction and you want to delay everything else. Um, so those variants are, like, I'll go through them in a, in a so let's talk about these stories that we talked about. So the status ICO, um, as I said on Reddit, people started talking about this, that something weird was happening. Um, and they they saw the suspicious activities. People talked about if to pull manipulated Ethereum blockchain during the ICO, um, accused of shady practices. There were like all different ways of talking about this. Um, and as you can see in this one, except apart from these issues, there was a report against F2 pool of removing users' transaction with their own transactions so they secure a position in the ICO before anyone else. So they're like this, it's really hard to like figure out what kind of attack that was. But based on our thing, we can just say it was a displacement attack. But adding the invariant block means that like it didn't target a specific transaction to prevent them from happening. It just prevent any transaction from happening. And if you have been around back then, the Ethereum network really like clogged for a few days. Like you couldn't really send your transaction. And really similar to CryptoKitties times. Um, another one, like Formal 3D. Uh, so 
some article said, oh, someone won this Ponzi scheme from a 3D. Some other were like, um, they played a special attack trick to sharply decrease the number of transactions packed by miners near the end of the game. Um, so they say special trick. Um, the other ones were just saying that he paid out and someone won the, 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 um, the game. Uh, this is one of the best uh, articles and analysis that say that talk about block stuffing attack that suppress a transaction. So in in overall within this framework, we can just call these suppression attacks or block stuffing attacks. Um, I like the name block stuffing, but in our framework we came up with suppression attacks. So we, I'm just sticking with both. So yeah, like there are some ways like except instead of like talking about like a paragraph, a whole article about what type of attack it was, you can use these frameworks to like easily talk about them. So one of the things that are interesting is asymmetric. So let's say in the cancel decentral exchange transaction. So you see the cancel transaction and you send a fill order transaction. So the transaction you're sending front running is different than the transaction you're sending. So it's asymmetric displacement or asset asymmetric insertion if you're a minor. So uh, more about the paper, what we did then, we really wanted to get, uh, find like top 25 DApps back then in September 2018. Uh, and it's really hard, like how would you define this? And uh, so we went by this website called DAP Radar. We sort everything based on user activity. Uh, and these are these um, DApps in this table are those, but also there were no ICOs happening back then like on that time frame. So we chose some ICOs, which is status ICO, end up in the paper. Um, I would suggest like reading the paper is like really interesting. Some of the parts writing the um, academic language with about like breeding crypto kitties and front running attacks on when we breed crypto kitties. Like, this was fascinating writing that. So while doing that, we, we found out about some um, key mitigations that we also systemized them. So there are like three main key mitigations about front running attacks. Transaction sequencing, confidentiality, and design practices. So um, transaction sequencing is really hard. Like um, you can't, it's really hard to get it in a distributed network to have some timing in there. So like basic blockchain itself can remove some ability to like change the order. So some of the ways would be like first in, first out, which as I said, it's almost impossible in this distributed network. Because if a transaction is first seen in China, it, it would probably not be the first one seen in like states or Europe and the other way around. And it's really hard to have that same time stamp. There are some ways of like mitigating this, like let's say go Ethereum or get. And there are some priorities uh, there that prioritize transaction based on their gas price as nonce. So if you ha have a higher gas price, you would be in top of the stack or top of the like, when you're sorting, it's like the one of the first and depends on the nonce too. Um, or there are some off-chain methods, like you can have this counter that off-chain adds to adds itself to the transaction and the smart contract knows how to order them. As you can see, order books in Zeta Ether Delta uses that. So I'm just gonna get some water. Yeah, so there are some other ways like pseudo random sorting. And this is one of the things uh, that happened in Bitcoin Cash ABC, which is called CTOR. Um, which what, what they do is in the blocks, they have to sort the transactions based on their hash. Uh, so it mitigates, like, first of all, Bitcoin doesn't have the front running issue as like Ethereum has. So it's not as critical. But um, this would basically sort the transaction in the block based on their hash. So it makes the problem much harder, but you have a lot of options in your transaction to change and change the hash. So you can change the salt, change the like random number and you get a different hash. So depending on what you want to do, probably there is a way to overcome this, uh, bypass this limitation. So the other one is the confidentiality. So, um, you, what you want to do is the limit the visibility of the transaction. So like when you're interacting with the DAP, there are like six different things that are leaking information or that information that you could hide. One is the code of the DAP, the state of the DAP, the name of the function you're calling, 
the parameters you're passing that function, the address of that contract, and the address or the identity of the sender. So there are different methods out there. We go through them um, one by one. So we have some privacy preserving blockchains that act similar to dark pools in high frequency trading, if you know about that. Um, I haven't seen that much in the practice, but like Hawk or Ekiden that both were done with Andrew Miller and friends, um, they talk about their implement these. So basically what they do is they hide the, the current state of the DAP and the name of the function and parameters. So it's good, but it doesn't do all, um, and I also haven't seen that in practice. We have other methods, commit and reveal, which you may know, um, it's really common in in dApps. So basically you uh, send uh, the hash of your transaction, hash of your data, and when you get in, there's a reveal phase when you reveal the information that hashes to that hash to initially sent. And they possibly hide the functions that are being called and the parameters that you're supplying um, or just the parameters. Because sometimes, let's say for the ENS, we'll see that someone is registering a known domain. We don't know what domain that is. Um, but also if it's collateral, let's say for the ENS case, it still leaks information. Like uh, you can still front run those transactions, paying more collateral without even knowing what domain you're buying. There's this enhanced one, which um, actually I, I was also a part of a team we worked on at IC3, I think three years ago, maybe two years ago. Um, it's uh, it enhanced to commit and reveal. You can check that there is, if you go to lipsupcoin.org, there is like some videos explaining it. Basically hides um, name of the function, parameters, and address. And in, on the blockchain, the commit transaction really seems like a transaction to an address that has never had a transaction, like a normal transaction, no data, just a value. Uh, it's really interesting. It's still high, like, it still needs more optimization, but it was an interesting approach. But the best thing to do is here is uh, to design, to just assume front running is unpreventable. Like you cannot fix this and just remove the benefit from it. Like, let's say if you can remove any importance of transaction ordering on time. So one of the examples that um, I'm working on with uh, my supervisor here is about, instead of like uh, time sensitive order books, which the order of the transaction matter, we can implement call markets, meaning that uh, every 10 minutes or every 10 blocks, which blocks would be better because it's random or random, the market will close. So no one knows that when the market is closing and when it closes, it basically matches every transaction in that time period. It removes any incentive to like order your transactions. There are still maybe some stuff going on, but like it removes that. Or some other thing that we've seen is the ERC20 allowance function approve. This was not designed in like front running mind. Like someone can just call approve for me uh, for 150 tokens. Then when they want to like decrease it to like 100, I can just front run that, spend my 150, and then um, have another 100 to spend. Later on, they implemented, I think, OpenZF imprint, like increase allowance and decrease allowance, which to mitigate this, they still have some issues there. So um, just to say front running is a pervasive issue in Ethereum dApps. We need to like talk about this more. This fr framework helps us like talking it with like less friction, be able to like point out the problems right away. Uh, we need usable dApps, commit and rebuild is good. It's still like not the best user friendly one. We might have a better way to doing this. And um, some other thing that I'm working on with some uh, colleagues is one this project called Theo, which is like basically a tool to front run or back run transactions. Um, it's easy to like just specify what transaction you want front run, what type of transaction, and it would just monitor the mempool to try to do that. We might try to like do front running of flash loans because that would be sweet. Um, and also I'm working with like Mythics team to be able to like define some of these, because it's really hard to like detect front running in static and code analysis or any code analysis. And if we use this category, categories that we have, we might be able to like def define better modules to identify some of them. Um, and it would be much easier to do that. And uh, with that, that's all. Like um, I'm open to any questions. 
if you want to get in touch with me, that's my um, Twitter and email. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it.